where Casey Anthony said she was taking her daughter Kaylee every night. She said her babysitters, Anida Gonzalez, lived in these apartments or at the Sawgrass Apartments. The police came here. The apartment was abandoned. We're at the bar in downtown Orlando where Casey Anthony actually came and partied every single night while she told her parents that she was working at Universal Studios. We don't know where Kaylee was when Casey was out at night with her boyfriend and friends, but we do know this is the bar where Casey was photographed in that blue dress, smiling, laughing, having the time of her life while her daughter was missing. That on-camera talent and videographer is our crack producer, Sarah Carden, who is as obsessed with this story as you guys are. So thank you, Sarah, for filing that report. Tonight, a woman nam named Zenaida Gonzalez is now suing Casey, saying Casey's lies about the imaginary Zanny the Nanny at the Sawgrass Apartments. Zenaida Gonzalez is the real person, and those lies have actually ruined her life. People actually thought that Zenaida Gonzalez, the person, had kidnapped Kaylee. Now, Casey gets out of jail on Sunday, so where is she going to go? Some are saying she might go to Puerto Rico with Jose Baez. There's another rumor that she might change her appearance, dye her hair blonde, use a fake name. Could she completely reinvent herself? I'm back with attorneys Mark Eiglarsh, as well as best-selling author Lisa Bloom. And joining me now in the studio is trial consultant for the defense team in the Casey Anthony case, Richard Gabriel. Richard, I'm going to start with you. Do you think Casey is going to need protection? Well, there's obviously a lot of threats out there about it, and we're obviously very concerned about her safety. And so my hope is that people will respect this jury's opinion and that they will uh, just calm down. I know it's upsetting. I know that these people are very... Uh, emotionally wrought about this verdict but the fact is that the justice system did work the way it was supposed to work in this case although people may disagree and my hope is that they don't take it out on Casey they don't take it out on any of the jurors now the, one of the thing I'm, I'm interested when I talk to you guys is that you know you, you the attorneys Lisa Mark uh, you guys see criminals uh, and Richard you see juries uh, okay. plenty of juries and so my you know I have no experience seeing somebody spin out of a high-profile jury case and recognizing a crowd frenzy that you know serving on a jury duty could actually put you in harm's way yeah. have you ever seen anything like that before well in a lot of high-profile cases they they actually we do find that jurors are completely unprepared for this phenomena which is essentially uh, this crowd sort of frenzy and especially they they try hard I mean these jurors worked six days a week for six to eight weeks and, and now, they're, now right they thing. did their job they did their job diligently right and yeah. now their lives are in danger is that really okay I, I no, is there something wrong here? Well, it, it's wrong, and I think, unfortunately, people don't understand that they really did see a different case than a lot of us at home. Well, talk to so. us about that. Help people understand that, so maybe that will pull the frenzy down a little bit. At least you certainly can address this, too, if you want. I, I mean, what did the, they see differently? The, what happened is we, we at home, we can speculate. We can have an emotional reaction. We can. Uh, we hear a lot of evidence that doesn't even come into the courtroom that a judge has ruled inadmissible. And we talk to other people about it. The judge... Does the jury on, on they the They can't Casey even talk case, amongst themselves. They can't talk amongst themselves. They can't speculate. They can't use, they're not supposed to use emotion to decide the case. But, but here's the big difference, too. You know, on television, we have graphics and whooshes and people pounding their fists, right? In the courtroom, there's a real air of solemnity that you don't see on television. I watched trials for eight years on court TV, and many times we were surprised by the outcome. When a juror gets into the courtroom, there's the judge and the robes and the intonation about the instructions. Jurors take their jobs very, very seriously. There's a gravitas. They don't hear, that's the right. Gravity. There's a gravitas that, you know, we don't necessarily have on these shows. Not that there's anything wrong with what we're doing. We have the First Amendment right to do it, to comment on it, to call it as we see it, but it's a very different flavor in the courtroom. Well, Mark, let me go out to you. Uh, the thing that's striking me now, which I'm hearing about for the first time, is this foreman of the jury feeling that George had some something questionable about him. Uh, they're not supposed to react with their emotions. Uh, that's certainly an emotional sort of gut take on George. What do you think they saw there? Well, I disagree with you. I think that they're allowed to use their emotions, they're allowed to use whatever they want in evaluating whether a witness is credible and or believable. Once he and, the, and several others who've spoken publicly found that he wasn't credible, well, then the state had a real problem because the defense made him out to be the centerpiece of the defense, and that's where they, they that minus the, all the other problems with their case, the cause of death, et cetera, really created problems for the state. 
And Mark, I mean, excuse me, Richard, with, with the jury, you know, they seem to not buy the, the prosecution's theory about the tape. Did the prosecution just miss something about that jury? Did they just assume that the jury was keeping up with them? Was that, was that the prosecution brainwashing themselves about their case? Well, I don't think they brainwashed themselves about the case. I, I think they truly believed in their own evidence. The fact is that jurors have an individual way of doing it. That's why we do research. That's why we did a focus group before this case to find really whether jurors could connect the pieces here. And I think even Jeff Ashton said, boy, that one photograph of the tape uh, really said it all to him. Uh, the fact is the tape was adhered to the to the hair and there was some uh, I think questions that the jurors had about really how it got there and it was represented. But, but why didn't they the pick face. that up? I mean that that's my I'm, I mean I look at that picture Lisa and True. I think huh? How'd that tape right, get there? Mark, Mark has a point. Okay, Mark go ahead. ahead. Yeah what, what, what happened to me when I was serving as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer is the minute you're on a case to some extent you lose some objectivity. You see the evidence the way you want it um, and it's not necessarily how the jurors are going to see it. So I think that might have happened too. It might have been very innocent. Um, Jeff Ashton, the other prosecutors believing so strongly in her guilt, so every piece of evidence that came across their desk, they saw a certain way, they thought it resonated a certain way with the jury, and maybe it didn't. And Lisa, I'll ask you this question. Did they also underestimate the defense, the prosecution? I think everyone underestimated the defense. Yes. Every, all of us who are commentators, I will say yep. that I underestimated the defense Marcus and my continuing the commentary. Yes. And I think we all I have to too. cop to that. The prosecutors, I mean, they got a unanimous jury verdict for the defense in 11 hours without a request for a single piece of evidence. This is a defense that did a very good job, and we have to all concede that. Richard, you agree? Yep. You're silent there. <laughs> the defense team right here who had a part in that? Uh, oh, of course I'd have to agree. I mean, the fact is that, you know, we were very confident in the case. And we, we took a look at this. We tested it. Did they overreach? The prosecution? I think by charging this was a death penalty case, yeah. the jurors attached more solemnity and, and wanted the, the evidence to be stronger. More, the reasonable doubt needed to be Especially in a almost death penalty noted. Case. I think that's right. Thank you guys, Mark, Richard, Lisa, and next, your.